Our scripture reading is in the Gospel of Mark, which we are continuing our studies in. Mark 11, we're going to look at verses 12 through 26. The Lord has arrived in Jerusalem in what uh, is commonly known as the uh, triumphal entry. And now we come to the next day. On the next day, when Jesus had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den? chief priests and scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they would go out of the city. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe, that you have received them and they will be granted you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's pray. Mark 11 begins the last week of Jesus' life, which indicates how important this final week was. It takes up six chapters in a book of 16 chapters. That's a a lot of space given to one week. Chapter 11 covers the first three days, Sunday through Tuesday. In them, Jesus is revealed as the promised Messiah, fulfilling prophecy. But days one and two give contrasting accounts of him. On Palm Sunday, he entered Jerusalem in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, as Israel's king, gentle and mounted on the foal of a donkey. He came in humility as a servant, not a Caesar. But when he returned to Jerusalem on Monday... He withered a fig tree with a curse, then drove the money changers out of the temple. Not what some would call or expect of a gentle Jesus. But both give a fuller picture of Christ. He was so gentle that the children were drawn to him. And so firm that men backed down from him. Our passage is about his response to hypocrisy and unbelief and gives a warning against worldliness and a divided heart. But it also gives the solution to all of that, which is faith, faith that can move mountains. Monday was a full day. It began early as every day did for Jesus. He and the disciples left Bethany for Jerusalem. Along the way, he became hungry. 
he happened to see a fig tree somewhere along the road on the Mount of Olives. It was in bloom, which was unusual, Mark says, because it was not the season for figs. Figs appear on trees immediately after they bloom, and though it wasn't the season, still the, the leaves indicated that it had fruit, and the leaves made it stand out from all of the other barren trees that were around. So Jesus noticed this, and he approached the tree, hoping to take some fruit and satisfy his hunger. But when he arrived, the tree had no figs. What Jesus did next has shocked and scandalized people. He cursed the fig tree. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Wow, what did the fig tree do to deserve that? New Testament scholar T.W. Manson called this the Lord's only miracle of destruction and accused Jesus of wasting his power and losing his temper. The British skeptic Bertrand Russell cited this incident as one reason for his unbelief in his book, Why I Am Not a Christian. He thought the Lord's anger at a fig tree was petty, calling into question his wisdom and virtue. And for that, he put Jesus below Buddha. William Barclay, the popular liberal commentator, called this the most difficult passage in the New Testament and unworthy of Jesus. Now, all of that is special pleading, false argument. In fact, there was nothing unworthy in what the Lord did. His action, as one writer said, was no more open to criticism than that of a child who destroys a Christmas tree in January. Now, his actions were not that of a child. In fact, they were the actions of a prophet giving a lesson to his disciples the way Old Testament prophets gave instruction. They often gave instruction with object lessons. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all engaged in activity that was sometimes strange or dramatic, but gave a lesson to the nation. And that's what the Lord was doing here. The tree with leaves advertised itself as a tree with fruit, but it was false. The tree promised to satisfy a person's hunger, but couldn't. And that was Israel's religion. It was barren. So seeking an opportunity to give a lesson and prophecy on the nation, Jesus cursed the tree and made it wither. He didn't curse the tree because it lacked fruit. It wasn't the season. He cursed it because the leaves promised fruit but produced none. It seemed to show vitality, but it was a false show. It was a picture of hypocrisy. So by cursing the tree and making it wither, he demonstrated in prophetic style God's hatred of hypocrisy and indicated God's judgment on it. The fate of the fig tree foreshadowed the fate of the nation. Not the nation as a whole, not the Jewish people, they have a future. Romans chapter 11 makes that very clear. But the Lord's generation was doomed by its unbelief. It had religion, it had lots of religion, but God doesn't care about religion. He cares about a relationship, and that is through faith. Now, under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, Israel was to carry out all of the, the ceremonies, all of the rituals of the law faithfully in obedience. But ritual without faith is hollow. It was an empty show, and God rejects that. In Amos chapter 5 and verse 21, he said, I hate your festivals. And we can add, he's not happy when, when we gather in this place without a real interest in doing it, without a real interest in being here, simply out of habit or custom 
or because we think there's some, uh, something that uh, gives us a, a spiritual advantage by just being here. But it's nothing more than just our presence. He's not pleased with that. He takes no delight in baptisms when those being baptized have no faith or participation in the Lord's Supper on a Sunday night when it's just an act without belief in the one represented by the bread and the wine. Those, don't, those actions don't please the Lord. That's, that's leaves without fruit. It, it's a show of religion without reality. It's hypocrisy and it's cursed. What God desires is faith in Him. Faith which joins people to Him, puts us in a relationship with Him that is like that of a branch in a vine, connected to life which produces fruit. That's reality. The only way we can produce fruit and have a truly productive life is through Christ. It's by being born again and by being joined to Him and receiving His life in us. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. And apart from Him, He's not pleased with anything that we do. If we belong to Christ, we will produce fruit. We will live a life with the moral virtues that Paul speaks of in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, Love, joy, peace, kindness, self-control, that's just some of them. There are nine virtues that are listed there. That will be the product of a, of a life that's truly joined to Christ. That's what the Lord wants to see. Now the disciples heard all of this, Mark says. His disciples were listening it would not be until Tuesday when they saw the tree withered that they would get the, the force of the object lesson. But they would soon see the reason for it when they arrived in Jerusalem and, and entered the temple. It had been turned into an oriental bazaar. To understand how that might happen, we, we need to get a picture of the temple. It was a huge complex. Now the temple itself was small, small building made of two compartments, the holy place and the holy of holies. But around it were, were courts that were divided off by walls. The closest to the sanctuary was the court of the priests. Only priests could be present there. Next to that, outside of that, was the court of the Israelites only male Israelites could enter it. Outside of it was the court of the women. And the outermost court, the largest court, was the court of the Gentiles. And from there, Gentiles could be present and they could view Israel's religion. Gave them an opportunity to see Israel's religion. It, it, it is, was in this outer court, the court of the Gentiles, that the market had been set up where Jews from foreign lands could exchange money to pay the temple tax. They had to pay it in a shekel. So if they brought money from Greece or Rome or Persia, they had to exchange it to get the proper money. And there they could buy animals for sacrifice. Uh, the, the tax had to be paid, and the Passover lambs had to be purchased. So by establishing the market in the temple, the priests had a monopoly on all of that. And like all monopolies, it was abused. The money changers overcharged for exchanging money, and the cost of the animals for sacrifice was very high. Now a worshiper could have brought his own lamb. It would be a cumbersome thing to do to travel from a, some distant land with his own lamb. <clears throat> but if he had done that and, and brought it to the temple, it had to be inspected. And chances were that the priests would not pass the lambs that had not been uh, 
purchased by them. So they would reject that. That was certainly the possibility, and no one was willing to take that risk. So the people were forced to do business at the temple where the priests and merchants were in partnership together. It was a, a lucrative business. It was a monopoly. <clears throat> the people paid the merchants for lambs. The merchants paid the priests a cut of their concessions. The priestly family of Annas and Caiaphas were enriched from the prophets. The Jewish scholar Alfred Edersheim noted that the rabbis of that day referred to this in their writings as the bazaars of the sons of Annas. It was a scandal. The, the one place where Gentiles could come near to Israel's religion, the only true religion, and be exposed to the light, they were exposed instead to money and merchants. They didn't see anything different at the temple from what they saw in the marketplace of Athens or Rome. As I said, it was a scandal. But it was also an occasion for Jesus again to reveal himself as the Messiah. He came to Jerusalem the day before in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. He came to the temple on this day in fulfillment of Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, where it was prophesied that the Messiah would come to his temple suddenly and be like a refiner's fire. He would cleanse it. That's what happened next. His anger burned because of what he saw. He'd seen it three years earlier when he drove out the merchants. This is actually the second cleansing of the temple. John records the first in John chapter 2. Some have argued that that's not the case at all, that there was really just one cleansing but the, uh, the gospel writers were either confused about that and spoke of two when there was only one, or John was simply making a theological point by transporting the cleansing that took place at the end of his ministry to the beginning of it. <clears throat> but in fact, there, there are significant differences between the two events, which uh, indicate that they're not the same. They are different. <clears throat> and really, <clears throat> if you think about it, that's quite predictable, isn't it? There is power in money and profit. And it's so strong, the allure of all of that is so strong, that it's not surprising that after three years, the bazaar would have been reopened. So now, at the end of his ministry, Jesus must cleanse the temple again. He did it with force. Mark describes it. He began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. Verse 16 says, and he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. Now that was an act of authority. He took the temple back from the merchants and he patrolled the court by keeping others from using it as a, a common shortcut to their places of business. No one opposed him. They all fled in terror of this one man single-handedly taking back the temple and policing it no gentle Jesus, meek and mild. This is God incarnate, angry, and justly. He reinstated the sanctity of the temple, his father's house, and, and restored it to its spiritual function by teaching the people. And that, that's what he says, and he began to teach them. He restored it to its spiritual function. He was giving light where light had been absent. He replaced the merchants and the money changers with the Word of God. And the Gentiles were watching and listening. 
He then justified his actions by quoting two passages of Scripture, Isaiah 56, verse 7, and where he calls the temple a uh, house of prayer, and then Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, where he called it a den of robbers. Putting the two texts together, he said, Is it not written, My father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you've made it into a robber's den. What should have been a place of prayer and worship was made a place of merchandise where people used religion for personal profit. Jesus called such men robbers, and he drove them out. Now, I think we might ask ourselves, that's interesting, and it does say a great deal about our Lord, about his authority, his power, but... What does that really have to do with us today? After all, the temple is gone. All that's left is the western wall, which was the, the very outer wall. We call it today the Wailing Wall. That's, that's what's left of the temple. So what's the relevance of this? Is there relevance to this? Well, in fact, it is quite relevant for today. We are the temple. The church is the temple. Paul calls us that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16 and asks, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Now what is the great idol in this age, or really any age for that matter? It's mammon. It's money. And that idol can easily find a place in the church that idol can easily find a place in the Christian's life. This is what Martin Luther reacted against in the 16th century when he learned of John Tetzel selling indulgences to German peasants, poor peasants, to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. That place was built on the money of the peasants of Germany. And so a great split occurred, the Reformation, the, the, the church that was uh, established through that, that great event of history took as its watchword Scripture alone. And there was again, once again, the teaching of God's Word in His temple. Well, we Protestants glory in the Reformation, but that was 500 years ago. What does the world see when it looks at us today? Well, very often what it sees is what those Gentiles saw, the bazaars of the sons of Annas. Of course, what comes to mind, I think, immediately as you think about that is what you see on television, what passes in the eyes of the world for genuine Christianity, which is the health and wealth stuff that is so popular on those TV programs, uh, goes out all over. And I think that that is certainly an application of this, but uh, that's maybe an easy application. I think for us as evangelicals who reject all of that, who see through all of that as false, and see the error in it, even we can have the problem that I think is drawn from this text, and that is we can begin to drift. That was the problem that the author of Hebrews saw in that church, probably a small church in Rome. You're drifting, he tells them in the second chapter, and that's easy to do. It's easy to drift for a variety of reasons, if maybe through the hardships that people are put through, or just through the, the environment in which we live, and particularly in this world, this place, it's so... Um, wealthy and there is so much of the world that is enticing and we, we can drift off into that. We can become distracted by that, enamored of that so that we become spiritually lazy and indifferent and the material things of life really occupy our hearts. Our faith can become secondary to other things. We've got to guard our hearts from that. We've got to guard our hearts from worldliness and materialism and 
being conformed to this world, as Paul warns in Romans chapter 12. Guard ourselves against limiting our spiritual life to something of an afterthought or one day out of the week, something that's secondary. The Lord's chief concern is our relationship with Him. And that's to be our priority. And when it is, and when we walk by the Spirit, walk in obedience to the Word of God, we won't do the deeds of the flesh. We won't be materialistic. We will be bold for Christ and we will live for eternity. We will live for what lasts. This life is brief and passing and all of the pleasures of it are gone in a moment. And we won't live for that. We'll live for what truly lasts. And the world, when it sees that, will be impressed with what it sees. And it will hear us by God's grace alone and not necessarily believe what we're saying, but at least it will listen when we preach the word and we speak of the gospel and when we live a life that's consistent with that. So we are the temple of God. You individually are a stone in the temple, living stones. And also, your body is the Lord's temple. So, what's in your heart? You often hear, what's in your wallet? That's what really concerns us. Well, what's in your heart? That's the more important question. It will become a robber's den if we're not careful. The Lord deals with that. He did with the church of Ephesus. In Revelation chapter 1, he appears to John on the Isle of Patmos, and John was dazzled by what he saw, and genuinely so. His eyes were like a flame of fire. No gentle Jesus there. His message to the church was, you have left your first love. Now that's, that speaks of a personal, intimate relationship with Him. Having a relationship of love speaks of walking with Him. It's, it, it, it speaks of being in intimate personal communion with Him. But He says to this church, which had many good things about it, they, they opposed heresy. They upheld the truth. They defended the gospel. Nevertheless, He says, you've left your first love. It's too much of a formality in your life now. Repent, he said, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. He comes to us as a church. He comes to us as individuals as he came to the Jewish temple to cleanse us, to discipline us, to cause us to repent and change. That should be our response. That should have been the response of those at the temple. It wasn't. It wasn't the response of the Jewish leaders. The, the temple was big business with big profits. So rather than repent, they plotted, Mark says in verse 18, how they might destroy him. No repentance. So judgment would come on them as it did on the fig tree, which was a prophecy of the temple's future and of the future of that unbelieving generation, cursed by God. It was a warning about hypocrisy. It was a warning against carefree unbelief. But it's also an encouragement to faith that's what the fig tree became to the disciples. That was uh, what the fig tree caused the next day. Jesus left Jerusalem in the evening and retired to Bethany. The next morning, Tuesday morning, they returned to the city. As they did, they passed the fig tree and Peter noticed that it was withered. Rabbi, look, he said, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. It wasn't the, the significance of the withering of the tree as a parable of judgment that impressed Peter, at least not at this point. Peter was impressed by the immediacy of the withering. 
in a day, in a moment, it was supernatural. And he could see that, and they could all see that. And, and that's what the Lord responded to. He told Peter, have faith in God. Now that was his plea to the disciples. It is a plea to us. Have faith in God. Now, that, that's not as disconnected from the meaning of the prophecy of the, the withered tree as it might seem, because this is the antidote to the curse and to materialism and to worldliness. Faith is the answer to that. That's John chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Faith in God is the way of escape. It's the only way of escape. And so the Lord capitalizes on Peter's wonder and emphasizes that. Have faith in God. In, in a world of unbelief, believe. Know God and honor Him genuinely from the heart. And, and you will experience even more amazing things than this withered fig tree. And then he says in verse 23... Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. The mountain is the Mount of Olives, and the sea is the Dead Sea, which could be seen from the Mount of Olives. Uh, that's where they were, and that's the scene that was before them, and that's the picture we have here. That's an impressive picture. But what does it mean? Well, certainly Jesus doesn't mean that if our faith is strong enough, we can literally uproot mountains and throw them across the sky, does he? And what purpose would that serve? What, what would be the good of Christians walking around and just uprooting mountains. So I'm going to move that mountain from Colorado and put it in Kansas. It's not what he means. This is the language of hyperbole, of, of exaggeration to make a point. Mountains are immovable. And here the mountain represents difficulties. The Lord is assuring them that there is no difficulty too great for those with faith. Real faith looks to the Lord. It is dependent on Him. He is the source of wisdom and power. He's the source of faith. And through Him, we can do greater things than wither a fig tree. When we face circumstances that seem impossible, well, they're impossible to us. And I would say really everything is impossible to us, but they are possible through God's power, which we appropriate through faith, rather through prayer made in faith, or through faith expressed in prayer. But either way, faith is essential, and prayer is essential. And in the next verse, the Lord emphasizes that when He says those things you pray for Believe that you have received them, and they will be granted you. Now, he wasn't saying in that, believing or thinking makes it so. It doesn't. In fact, the notion that we can move a mountain literally if we have enough faith is really having faith in faith. Prayer is not some magical Aladdin's lamp. We just get what we want and we'll get it all if we just believe hard enough. True prayer seeks what God wants. First and foremost, we seek what God wants. It is according to God's will. Faith is necessary, but in the New Testament, faith is simply trusting in God's revealed will and not doubting it. True prayer seeks what God wants. In order for our prayers to be effective, we must pray according to God's will. 
literally moving mountains is not his will. And again, it's not the point of his instruction here. The Lord is teaching the power of believing prayer and the means, and that means that believing in him is believing in his word and believing in his promise. Prayer is always made, effective prayer is always made according to his will. Now that's stated elsewhere. That's stated, for example, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Anything according to his will. God has made promises to his people. We are to know them. We are to know his word and pray according to them and, and believe that he is good for his word, that he's reliable. That is essential for effective prayer. Abraham is an example of that. God promised him a son. And you know the story of Abraham and Sarah and the great trial they went through for many years. Promised them a son. Years passed without a child. It was when they were old. It was when they were past the age of producing children that Isaac was born to them. It was an impossible mountain to move. But it happened. Not because Abraham and Sarah desired to have a boy and, and just had enough faith for it. It's because God promised that. It was all according to God's will. He had revealed that to them and they believed it. At times their faith was weak. At times they didn't quite understand. But they believed it. Even with small faith, they believed. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 stated that by faith Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the, pro the proper time of life. Effective prayer then is not the result of faith in faith, faith believing in faith, faith believing that it, if, I, if I just have enough faith I can get what I want. That's not it. It's faith in God. It doesn't insist on its own way. It relies on God and does not doubt, does not question God's character. This is what Jesus was telling his disciples to do, earnestly telling them to do this. This was his plea. Believe in God. Believe in his word. Pray according to it. God blesses that. So how do we get that kind of faith? How does our faith grow? By knowing God. Now remember what happened in the temple. He cleansed the temple. He drove out the money changers and the merchants and then began teaching. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want strong faith? There must be teaching in the temple. There must be sound doctrine in your heart. It's what Paul emphasizes that in uh, 1 Timothy, at the beginning of the book, uh, he, he tells Timothy, stay in Ephesus and deal with these men who are teaching strange doctrine. And then you go down through the passage and what he emphasizes is sound doctrine, which literally is healthy doctrine. You want to be spiritually healthy? Have sound doctrine. The Word of God. It's through that that our faith is nourished and we grow. And by growing in our relationship with Him, and that involves prayer, the Lord speaks to us through His Word, we speak to Him in prayer through that, our relationship grows and develops, and then our life becomes more effective. That's what Israel lacked. Instead of being a house of prayer, Jesus said they had made the temple a den of robbers. That's really the, the connection here between the temple, the fig tree, and the Lord's plea for them to pray. For all of the ritual in the temple, there was no real prayer there because there was no faith and no relationship with God. 
Fruit is the natural product of a healthy tree. And prayer and all obedience is the result of a healthy relationship with the Lord. It's the result of knowing Him and loving Him and walking with Him. Well, that relationship, when it's a vital relationship, makes us humble about ourselves and gracious toward others. The Lord states that in verse 25. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. The meaning isn't conditional forgiveness, but that anyone who harbors bitterness doesn't understand the grace of God and his great forgiveness. That person is a hypocrite. Like like the temple and the priests and the merchants. They have had a, a profession, but it was fruitless. Like the fig tree. God didn't answer their prayers. Their prayers were meaningless. Effective prayer involves a loving heart or mind that understands grace. It's a heart that is new, a life that's been born again, and that has faith. And proof of that is willingness to forgive. Putting all of this together, fruitlessness invites a curse. Faith is the solution. Genuine faith results in a fruitful life and effective prayer. The evidence of such faith is love, it's forgiveness. And the greatest love man can have is for the Lord, it's for Him who loved us and gave Himself for us in the greatest demonstration of love in all of the universe. So do you love Him? Have you believed in Him? If not, look to Him, trust in Him, He is life, and through faith in Him, we're joined to Him and joined to His life and joined to a fruitful and blessed life. God help you to look to Him and believe in Him and you who have to seek to cultivate that relationship with Him, that love for Him and that walk with Him. God bless us all in that way.